Uh, hello, hello everyone. I hope uh, you are doing good and I hope that you've had a wonderful day. It's another great time that we get to meet. Uh, thank you so much for joining on time and um, I think the rest will join us as we continue. And it's a great pleasure once more uh, to meet and really discuss more about EMR. And I'm really happy that today we have with us an EMR expert and uh, a colleague who is really passionate about EMR. I've seen a lot of her work and she's really passionate and she really inspires me a lot. And I would love to welcome you, uh, Dr. Frinish Amir, to the session. And thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate uh, and we love to hear from your great experience and also from your exposure. So I'll just introduce you a bit, then I'll hand it over to you. Um, so we've made you co-host, so you have the ability to share. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Thank you once more. Uh, sorry, I'm not able to share my uh, video. Uh, net network is quite a bit shaky on my end, but that's me there. Um, so I'll start with introducing our guest today. Uh, that is Dr. Nisha Mill, and um, who uh, really she really holds a lot of titles, and uh, she's really done a lot. So she's a medical microbiologist with over 13 years of experience in clinical microbiology and infectious diseases. And she's currently working as a project director, National Fungal Disease Surveillance System at National Institute of Health, Pakistan. She's working on implementation of National Action Plan on antimicrobial resistance, GLASS, EMR, and AMC surveillance, a stewardship and advocacy in Pakistan. She also works on Pakistan EMR surveillance system, Asia Pathogenic Genomic Initiative, Tricycle and Health EMR surveillance project, environmental surveillance of cholera and antimicrobial stewardship program. And she has 51 publications in national and international journals, and many other are underway. She's a Harvard Kennedy School and a GCSP Geneva alumna and GPAD Fellow on Biosafety and Biosecurity, that is in Germany, lead auditor of ISO 9001-2015 and chair of Emerging Leaders Program in Infectious Diseases, that is ICID, and uh, visiting faculty at Rawapindi Medical University. She's a member of WHO uh, Advisory Group on Bacterial Priority Pathogen List, member of WHO Group for Global EMR Research Agenda in Human Health, Pakistan Biological Safety Federal Safety Association, Federal Region, Chapter Head, Consultant Clinical Microbiology for American Society of Microbiology, USA, and board member of the Menas Fatima Foundation, Gitgit. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Frinish. You've really done so much, and uh, we are really inspired to have with us today. And uh, over to you now. Thank you so much for joining us, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, thank you for a very good introduction, and it was very long. Um, uh, I am Dr. Afrina Shamir, as Daniel has mentioned, and it is my pleasure and honor to be part of this very, very important platform. And I'm very happy to see all the activities done by the students from uh, against uh, superbugs. Uh, the group is doing a lot, and I've been watching the work on the social media, on the LinkedIn, on the web page. And I congratulate you all on the great work from the Africa. So uh, today I've been asked to discuss about discuss about the effect of the environment and role of the environment in particularly in the mitigation of AMR. So it's a little, little complex topic and there are a number of elements that are being part of this topic. So I'm definitely going to touch every topic in brief and we, I try to cover different aspects. Uh, Daniel, am I able to share my screen? Yes, I can. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So I think my screen, screen is visible. And uh, just to begin with this thing that uh, uh, and I've been working on the antimicrobial resistance, particularly on the human health sector. And uh, very recently, I've been started to work on the concept of a one health. And this one health concept of AMR talks about the three areas, the human health, the animal health, and the environment health. And with the time, we have realized that en environment is considered as the most important factor. It's actually the threat multiplier. What is the terminology that has been recently coined? That it is a threat multiplier. And uh, considering the AMR, whatever happening, the mixing of the genes, antibiotic resistant gene is all happening in the environment. And today, we are going to different, uh, discuss different aspects on this thing. 
As you all know about the antimicrobial resistance, I'm not going to go into the very much details, but it is the capacity of the microorganisms that they are able to resist the antibiotics which are supposed to, which are used to kill them. And uh, this, effect, uh, this antimicrobial resistance is not limited to one area. As I have discussed, it is it's been expanded to all the three sectors. So going towards a more detail in this thing that uh, AMR is, uh, just give me a second. Uh, AMR, there are many human activities which include the treatment particularly. And then this is followed by the disposal of the human sewage and the animal waste. And they can all affect the number and kind of the resistant bacteria in people, animals, and the environment. So it's a little complex thing. Uh, there are basically the two worlds. One is a human world, one is other is a microbe world. And whatever we are doing to protect ourselves from the effect of the microbes, the microbes are equally acting to protect themselves for, from all the actions that we are taking. So it's kind of a action and reaction kind of a phenomena. And based upon this action and reaction, how, how much is the antibiotic selection pressure? There's, the same will be the response from the environment. The bacteria present in the environment, they will react in the same manner. Bacteria can develop a resistance to these treatments and which makes them less effective as discussed earlier as well. Now, particularly the role of the environment. As I have told that it is considered as a threat multiplier. And uh, where for a very long time, it has been recognized the importance of the environment uh, at uh, global scale. And now countries are working to develop the plan at the national scale as well. So the environmental regulate, regulators, they monitor and control many of the pathways responsible for the release of the resistance driving chemicals into the environment. So uh, uh, all the, at the global level, at the national level, all the regulators, the policymakers, the stakeholders, the partners, they all are working to understand the role of the environment, particularly in the pathways, that how it is engaged in, uh, in the transmission of the resistance genes in the acquisition of the resistant genes. Environmental regulators should be contributing significantly to the development of the global and the national antimicrobial action plans. So the uh, so role of the environmental regulator is not limited only to the understanding the pathways, but eventually contributing to a bigger national action plan or bigger global action plan. Now, uh, understanding and managing the role of environment in the development and spread of AMR is a vital task. And what it helps, finally, it helps to uh, control uh, the overall vision that we have to combat the AMR across the globe. There's a use of antimicrobials in human, plants, and animal sectors, and they all contribute to the environmental load of the antimicrobial resistant bacteria, antimicrobial resistant genes, the antimicrobial residues, and metabolites. So whatever you, we are using in the three sectors, the use of the antimicrobials, eventually the, there is a shed off or, or of all these antimicrobials in the environment. And uh, they, there's a constant uh, understanding on this thing that without the inclusion of environment in all the policy making, uh, we won't be able to mitigate the AMR in a very effective manner. So now we talk about different pathways through which uh, the environment is playing a role through which AMR is interconnected. Potentially high level of antimicrobials and high level of antimicrobial resistant genes, they can be found in the waste streams from the humans, also from the animals and also from the plants treated with the antimicrobials, as well as in the effluent from the wastewater treatment plants. The sewage of the antimicrobial manufacturing plants. This is one small, uh, apparently the antimicrobial manufacturing, it seems a very, very uh, clean and neat process. But the sewage which is generated from these antimicrobial manufacturing plants, it enters eventually into the environment. And somehow it is disrupting the ecology. Somehow it is disrupting the antimicrobial resistant genomic pattern within the environment. Now, importance of incorporating the environmental sector in the mitigation of AMR. This has been highlighted a number of times. Uh, what is actually required that uh, if they, there's a need to work towards an effective water supply, sanitation, hygiene, and waste management strategies. 
there's a need to do a number of research uh, projects that that will cater all these three different areas that I have just mentioned. Also, there's a need to work towards environmental surveillance and monitoring. So surveillance is, uh, if I define it very briefly, it's the ongoing systematic collection of the data. Uh, whatever, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. You collect the data, you try to understand the patterns, you try to understand the trends, you try to understand the behavior, what is happening. And based upon this data analysis, you are able to make out some policies, some best management practices, and uh, this is all interconnected. And there's a newly defined term that has been evolved. Uh, you all have, must have heard about the antimicrobial stewardship which is the responsible use of the antibiotics. You all must have heard about the uh, diagnostic stewardship that we have to be very vigilant while working in the laboratories. And now there's a term point, environmental stewardship, that we have to be very much careful in our approach towards working with the environment, uh, like uh, how the sewage is being uh, managed in the environment. What are we throwing back in the environment? And uh, the impact of all this is uh, a very, very strong response from the environment in terms of evolution of the bacteria and the microbes. Now, a uh, few other points that I want to highlight over here. Uh, the antimicrobial use, they drive the development of antimicrobial resistance, uh, not only in the humans, but also in the livestock, aquaculture, and plant production. The challenge is that the spread of AMR is fueled by inadequate waste management, pollution, and non-use factors, other non-use factors. At the global scale, antimicrobial, they are used in higher quantities in terrestrial and aquatic animal production than in humans. So this is a very valid study available that clearly mentioned that the use of the antimicrobial is much higher in the animal sector as compared to humans. And uh, Parallelly, the livestock produce uh, four times more fecal matter than humans, which is eventually uh, being disposed of in the environment. Um, to, to add to all this, there's a, a study that mentions that uh, around uh, from 10 to 80 percent of the antimicrobials which are being administered to the animals is absorbed or metabolized. And the remainder, it goes back into the environment, either through the urine or the feces. So this is a very, very complex process. Uh, we all have seen the picture of One Health showing the cross uh, linkages and cross communication between the three sectors. And whatever we are investing in the human sector, whatever we are using in the livestock, eventually it goes back into the environment. So what are the consequences? Now the question is, if, the, if we are unable to manage all this thing properly, the wastewater and manure from the intensive livestock production and aquaculture. It can be a huge, huge source of the antimicrobial uh, resistant organisms, not only the uh, not only organism, but the genes, and the antimicrobial compounds and the metabolites. There is another component that has been uh, that has been ignored many of the time. It is a runoff waste from the slaughterhouses. This can be an important potential source of uh, the resistant microorganism within the community. Now, we talk about the other different aspects that how environment is involved in AMR. There, uh, there are different environmental agencies which are working in different countries. And these environmental agencies, they have been uh, working under different objectives, vision, and policies. But more or less, they consider that they, uh, they should work in the area of environment under, under uh, the following points that I have mentioned over here. They consider the environment from the wastewater treatment plants, from the land spreading of the manure and the biosolids, uh, from the air transmission or what we call as the bio aerosols, aquacultures, shellfish bed, food plants, and ecological health. So one by one, we are definitely going to discuss all these points. This is again the same presentation that the, there are six different elements that are being considered by the all the um, agencies which are working at the national level, even at the international level. Now the wastewater treatment plants, they are uh, one of the, uh, I say a very fantasy area or a good area that I, I always fantasize that how this thing, all thing works. 
but the eventual impact of all, the, all these wastewater treatment plants uh, on the AMR is huge. And this needs to be considered uh, very seriously. Wastewater treatment plants, they are managing the waste from the human side and uh, they use antibiotics, biocides, metals, and they, finally, the, all these, they enter into the sewage treatment plants. Uh, they are discharged as a component of the effluent and the sludge. The sludge can be composted or anaerobically digested and applied to land or incinerated. The proportion of the antibiotics, the metals, the biocides in the effluent and in sludge is highly variable, and it depends on the sewage treatment plant catchment characteristics, presence of the hospital wastewater, nature of the sewage treatment plants and its operational parameters. So uh, wherever, whatever the catchment area from where the sewage is coming, it is the actual thing that uh, it depends that how much is the um, proper proportion or how much is the prevalence or the uh, pre presence of the antibiotic resistant genes. Waste water treatment plants, they do not efficiently remove all the antibiotic resistant genes that are subsequently released in treated effluents. So this is something really interesting for me as well, that uh, the, we expect that these treatment plants, they are able to remove all the different uh, hazardous materials, but for considering the ARGs, antibiotic resistant genes, they still remain in part of this uh, effluent. Upon entering the river or estuary or coastal, coastal water, the sewage effluent will be diluted. The resulting concentration of the pollutants will interact with the native flora, fauna, and begin to change the microbial community structure and genetic maker. So it's, it's, little, it's a little all complex thing. Um, I was a little short of time. I could have shown you some of the flow charts, particularly um, and help you to understand that how all this complex thing works. Whatever uh, antibiotic resistant genes they left behind from the treatment plants, eventually they are disturbing the ecology. Uh, they are disturbing the flora and fauna. And uh, eventually it's not a one day process. It will take some time, but whatever it happens, after some time we see some kind of pandemics, endemics. Uh, we see some kind of very complex situation that in which we are unable to treat, treat the human infections. Now the wastewater treatment uh, discharges, this is just I have discussed, they are eventually affecting the ecosystems. Um, the introduction of these pollutants into the recreational and the coastal bathing water, primarily through the combined sewer overflows, will elevate the exposure of the humans uh, to all the resistant pathogens. Uh, the, so this is another complex thing. It's not only that finally this uh, whatever passing through the wastewater treatment plants going into the coastal water, but somehow it may be reaching the recreational water. And from there, there are huge chances of uh, uh, humans being exposed to the resistant uh, bacteria. Now another concept, and I told you that environment is huge. And uh, there are different concepts of the environment that needs to be understood. I tried to put everything over here uh, just to make, your, make you understand. Land spreading of the manure and the biosolids. Very, very common practice. This is what we see. The human and the animal use antibiotics, biocides, metals, and antibiotic resistant genes can all be found within the products, such as a seaweed sludge, anaerobic digestate, manure, and which are spread upon agricultural soil. And what is the purpose behind it? That they are used as a fertilizer most of the time. And dissemination of these materials in the soil finally it increases and, uh, the, the exposure to the antibiotic resistant genes. So the soil is not kind of, it's not a non-living thing. There are a number of things uh, like uh, bacteria are present over there, microbes are present over there, animal feeds from these kind of soil. Uh, so it's like, a, it's a complex thing now. Now humans, they are working in the soil. So now there's a now there's a chain of uh, transmission start from here. The persistence and changes in the resistome of the sludge or manure after it is anaerobically digested or composted is only recently emerging. So there is a this concept is new, but still this is playing a huge role towards one of the uh, uh, consideration of the AMR. Another thing that increase in the prevalence of the key resistant genes in the bacterial and bacteriophage fraction after digestion of sludge 
led to conclude that the agricultural use of the treated sludge could contribute significantly to spread the antibiotic resistant genes in the environment. So it's not only that they know the, that the scientists, they know the fact that this is one of the contributing factors, but they also know this thing that if we work on, the, on treating this factor, we will be definitely able to control the spread of the antibiotic resistant genes in the environment. Number of studies have been conducted. One of the study mentions that the persistence of antibiotics, it increases at lower temperatures. It increases in the deeper soil layer where there, where there, is, um, there is no light or less light is present. And there's, uh, there are certain high organic conditions in which the antibiotics, they remain persist in the environment. I move to the next slide about the concept of air transmission or the bioaerosols. Um, Daniel, if there are any questions, I can take in the middle, or if you can, uh, you can put in the chat box. We can discuss after the this discussion. So there's a widespread manure distribution either through the feedlots or land spreading can facilitate the dissemination of antibiotic resistant genes. Uh, several antibiotics have been recorded downwind of feedlots at concentrations similar to that found in river streams of sewage outlets. So again, uh, there's a study that has been conducted and it shows that um, there are uh, not only antimicrobials, that there are antifungals that have significant aerosol dissemination pathways. And broadcast application of azole fungicide has likely facilitated the emergence of azole fungicide resistance in aspergillus fumigators. Again, the same thing, um, I don't want to repeat this concept of uh, azole resistant aspergillus fumigators through the environment. Now, another uh, important element, aquaculture. This is a term that we have been listening all the time. And uh, uh, the role of the aquaculture is very much uh, getting more important by the time as we are moving more towards uh, uh, the reasons of AMR, the unable to control AMR. Where there is a veterinary use of the antibiotics, there is a fish farm where there is a use of antibiotics. And uh, uh, the use of these antibiotics in the fish farms, eventually they are released in the environment and contributing to the spread of the antibiotic resistant genes. The accumulation and chronic exposure of the river, um, the coastal environment to these AMR drivers can persist and spread AMR into the land from the sediment. Uh, the World Organization for Animal Health, they have developed some standards in the Aquatic Animal Health Code and they are they have highlighted this thing in the in the standards that what could what should be the balance of the use of the antimicrobials in the fish farms i can skip this slide i think and uh, yes exactly now these are the last few slides uh, so now when we understand that there is a huge disposal of the uh, you can say that uh, waste uh, either from the human side, either from the animal side, either from the hospital side. Now the question is, uh, there's one industry that needs a special attention. That is the pharmaceuticals. We know that antibiotics are being produced and uh, they are produced in the pharmaceutical companies. And uh, there are a number of methods that have been suggested to the pharmaceutical kinds, uh, uh, industries that they must use to manage their waste. Uh, we all must aware of all these terminologies. I will just quickly go through all of uh, one by one. Incineration or the thermal treatment, the high temperature is used to burn the uh, waste. And finally, that waste is uh, uh, the, the solid waste it converted in the form of uh, ash. And this ash is going to be uh, again. It is. It it is. It is going into in the form of a environment in the form of a secure landfill. So now here comes the complex process. Uh, first, the process of incineration should be very uh, vigilant. Should be very smooth. Should be following all the standards. Should be following the appropriate temperature. Should be following the appropriate timeline. And once there is ash, it should be properly dis disposed of. And there are chances that if it is not properly treated from that ash, the resistant genes or resistant organism, they can spread into the environment. The second method being suggested is the uh, chemical disinfectants. 
there is a very common practice that we use the chemical disinfectants to uh, dispose of the uh, 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 dispose of the waste. Uh, the effectiveness of the process of depends on the type of the chemical used, its concentration, and nature of the contact between the disinfectant and material in the waste. Another me method that is suggested for some of the industries is the microwaving. And it, it involves the use of the microwave radiations to destroy the infectious material present in the biomedical waste. Autoclaving, very commonly used in microbiology laboratories. Also, they are used in the, uh, in the, at the in pharmaceutical industries and uh, where there is the production of the biomedical substances. And the waste, is, the waste that has been generated, it undergoes a saturated steam and uh, for a particular duration and the time, and it is able to destroy all the pathogens. Secure landfill, this has already been discussed. Uh, the waste uh, that needs to be disposed of, it is buried in a landfill, and uh, that has been designed to contain the hazardous waste. So a, a very important thing is like, uh, it's landfill does not mean that you dig up a hole and put all the waste, there, but the landfill, the type of the soil, the type of the catchment area, the type of the um, um, dispose, uh, the land that you are choosing for the landfill, uh, the nearby surroundings of that landfill, if it is not connected with any sewage uh, lines, if it is not connected with any coastal area. So these are all the consideration needs to be uh, considered while selecting for the secure landfill. Now, the interventions that have been developed to control uh, AMR from an env environmental aspect. So, uh, uh, so it's, it's again the repetition, the same thing. The research is not being limited to one area, but uh, there's uh, another approach that has been, uh, uh, that has been uh, considered very important over the period of time. It's the behavioral change. Uh, the approach towards the use of antimicrobials in the fish farms approach to use the antimicrobial in the livestock. This needs to be considered to create, awareness needs to be create, create, uh, cre uh, considered on particularly on this thing. We all know about the harmful effects of AMR, but we all do not restrain ourselves to follow the standard or the guidelines. So it is all again connected with the behavior approach. And there's a much of the interest towards this area. I guess this is the last slide. Uh, some of the key points that uh, are being considered for the interventions uh, to develop and evaluate the impact of a range of site-specific interventions in agricultural and aquaculture systems, including food and water to reduce AMR risk to human population, uh, to develop a decision support tool. Yes, this is important from the point of view of uh, stakeholders and the policymakers that uh, they need they are they are looking at the issue from a very holistic approach so they need to help the researchers to identify uh, the best intervention in the specific settings develop and test the pest and pathogen controls to better manage livestock and fish disease and reduce the use of antimicrobials and finally overall understanding the cost and benefits of interventions to tackle the AMR from a One Health perspective. So this not only involves uh, only one sector, it involves a very complex chain from the global plans to the national level, then to stakeholders then the partners, uh, then the, all the members of the uh, ecosystem and all the members who are working in the closed chain system. So I guess this is the last slide. Uh, with this, I come to the end. I thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm available. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Frinish, for that really informative session. We really do appreciate. And uh, I, I acknowledge that it's quite uh, very late on your end, and we really appreciate you for that sacrifice, for joining us, uh, despite it being very late on your end. And uh, so we'll just take a few questions. And as you usually do, guys, if you have a question, you can just raise your hand or type it in the chat box. I can see we have one from Jennifer, and she's asking how we uh, how we dispose expired drugs. And I would also like to maybe uh, go ahead and maybe uh, also expand on the question, especially in you know in low and middle income countries, uh, whereby maybe you have some excess uh, drugs. Uh, okay, so it's not supposed to arise because it's supposed to finish the dose. 
but in cases where you have some um you know antibiotics excess antibiotics especially from uh, a consumer setting in the household uh what would you be your advice on this yeah thank you um yes uh, daniel very very relevant questions and uh, i must say from the concept of lmic this is this been a huge problem uh what is being suggested uh if i take the example of the developed countries it is always suggested that if there is expired medicine they should drop off the medicine at that drug take back site from where you have brought, uh, bought the medicine it's it's always suggested that whatever is left behind it should be sent uh, if you have it is in the home you should take it back to back to the pharmacy and uh, uh, give them give the, the leftovers back to them and this seems a very very ideal method but in considering uh, the situations like in uh, lmics including uh, in our country as well this seems a little little complex it is not po possible um, that we that we this is not possible it is no legislation or regulation that we all are bound to uh, give the leftover and medicines back to the pharmacist uh, whatever what we are doing actually we are just throwing the expired medicine in the rubbish bin or we flush them down the toilet or we flush them in the kitchen sink this is a common practice and this is all what is contributing to the increasing amr in the environment um, this is not recommended but the recommended method i i am telling you that you have to drop off the medicine back to the pharmacy or if your uh, government has developed a location or a program there you should give uh, send back the expired medicines Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Prinish. Uh, we'll take one from uh, Adrian. You can go ahead. Then Jerry. Yeah, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, first of all. But my question is regarding to uh, apiculture, uh, like honeybees. Uh, also, the honey is related to produce honey is related to environment, as I said about. Uh, I would like to ask the question: How can you control those antibiotic resistance in honey, honey bees? Thank you. Ah, oh, little complex. Uh, yeah, I am not the very right person to answer this question. I just mentioned in the beginning. I work more towards the human side, so I just have to understand a little more on this area. I'm sorry, Adrian, but I will definitely uh, can. Google it or ask someone and get back to you the right answer. I have my email with you, and uh, uh, definitely you can drop me an email and we can discuss this thing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Finish. Uh, Jerry, how about you? Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And my question is uh, I have a friend who has a little poultry farm close to where I stay. And with the poultry farm, the feed he gives to the the, um, the poultry, um, he says he mixes it with antibiotics for them to keep, um, because um, he just doesn't want them to get infected. And he just want them to go. But then at the end of the day, he goes to the poultry farm to sweep the hen, the poultry droplets with the leftover um feed this leftover feed will definitely have antibiotics in it so each and every day how is it going to dispose this looking at the landfill you talked about um, is it going to be an effective way for him to dispose the um the droppings each day yeah that's my question yes uh a very relevant question. This is actually the use of the growth promoters in the poultry sectors. Uh, this is a common approach that we see that in order to control the diseases, uh, very there are very common uh, diseases and contagious diseases within the poultry and they, they are growth promoters, they are widely used. And uh, disposal of these growth promoters, again, it's a very complex question. Uh, uh, the ideal way is that they should be uh, uh, they should go towards back to from where you bought it or either is like you can go for a very good landfill and uh, but finding a landfill is again a difficult complex process. So 
So uh, either of the methods can be chosen to uh, to uh, so that they are not uh, very wrongly used in the environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Prinish. Um, Idris, do you have a question? Uh, anyway, oh, I can see we are muted for a while. Anyway, um, I think. Hello, Idris. Uh, yes. Idris, do you have a question? Sorry. Hello, Idris. Okay, maybe it was by error. Yeah. So I think uh, thank you so much, Dr. Prinish. I I think we don't have uh, another question, but just a lot of appreciation in the chat. And thank you so much for joining us today. So at this juncture, maybe you can then uh, maybe share your final remarks, then I think we can call it a session. Thanks so much. Over to you. Thank you, Daniel, for the excellent platform. And I think I, am, I may be able to generate some, um, some questions in the mind of the, all the participants. They can think in the different areas where they can uh, do the research, they can identify this no, environment is complex, it's huge. So it's like you cannot, uh, you can find a number of areas where you can start the work. So, but, but you just have to understand the different aspects of the environment and there you can find the number of research options. And also uh, doing the research, you will definitely contribute to mitigate the AMR. Thanks to all of you for being here and listening to me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Prinish, for really uh, joining us, even when it's very late on your end. And uh, thank you so much. We appreciate uh, your wise words and also for taking us through. And we are really glad. Thank you to our participants for joining in today. Thank you to my co coordinator, Anastasia. And I wish us all a wonderful evening and all the best. Bye-bye, uh, everyone. And, uh, Bye, Dr. Finish, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I was mute. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll, time, we'll talk to you all of you sometime later uh, on, on another good topic. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.